Wayne Newton was a remarkable, legendary performer who shocked the public at the age of 80 by revealing his life of extreme poverty. In this video, we have updated details about his life after losing all of his assets, so don't miss it. According to legend, Wayne Newton began his professional singing career at a remarkably young age. Although Wayne Newton is best known for his singing, he is also a talented musician who can play a variety of instruments, including the guitar, banjo, and piano. He began his rise to fame in the 1960s, having achieved great success as a musical artist at the age of six. Daddy, Don't You Walk So Fast? and Red Roses for a Blue Lady are two of the hit songs that greatly boosted Wayne's popularity. These songs not only cemented his place in the music industry, but also attracted a sizable fan base because of his numerous accomplishments and iconic status in the field of popular entertainment. People would assume that Wayne Newton is in good financial standing today, but sadly, reports suggest that the singer is currently in serious financial trouble and is practically broke, despite his prior success. This unexpected financial downfall is a stark contrast to his earlier career, with heights highlighting the unpredictability of both the entertainment industry and personal finances. While it is true that Wayne is a talented singer, he has consistently lacked proficiency in managing his finances. This oversight meant that he frequently delegated important financial decisions to others, which has contributed to his current dire financial situation. Other complex and interconnected factors that have contributed to his current financial troubles include his historical disinterest in the business aspects of his career. The consequences of Wayne's disengagement from his financial affairs were made worse by those who did not always have his best interests at heart. Wayne's ambitious and diverse career pursuits throughout his career included ventures like owning the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. This expansion into different domains required careful financial management. The early 1980s saw the emergence of Wayne Newton's financial issues, which also happened to be the time of his attempt to take over the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. At the time, Wayne had grown tired of working for others, particularly after more than 10 years of being associated with an entertainment business owned by the renowned mogul Howard Hughes. Although he didn't treat Wayne badly, Howard Hughes was keen to assert his independence and establish himself as his own man in the entertainment industry. Hughes was a multifaceted figure best known for his involvement in aviation in Hollywood and, perhaps less well-known, his significant role in the Las Vegas scene. Sadly, Wayne's pursuit of his goals and financial independence led him to make some controversial decisions in the entertainment industry. In order to establish himself in Sin City, he ultimately allied himself with organized crime, which was a dangerous and dark path that ultimately led to Wayne Newton's downfall. The public's discovery of his connections to the Mafia dealt the first blow to his once thriving empire. Rumors of these connections began to circulate in the media, and it eventually became clear that there was substantial truth to these claims, despite the growing body of evidence. Wayne then made the surprising decision to sue NBC News and file a lawsuit on Lyle's behalf in an attempt to clear his name. Wayne was given a substantial sum of money when he initially prevailed in the lawsuit, but the case did not end there. An appeal was held because it was found that there was insufficient proof to support the claim that Wayne had mafia connections, and as a result, his initial multi-million dollar victory was gradually overturned. Wayne suffered a great deal during this legal ordeal, as he could have benefited greatly from the financial compensation, especially given the serious financial difficulties he was facing at the time. Unfortunately, Wayne's financial problems only got worse as the 1980s went on, as he owed money to the wrong people and the lawsuit's loss had serious consequences that ultimately led to bankruptcy. When Wayne Newton filed for bankruptcy in 1992, he discovered that he owed an incredible $20 million to numerous creditors. Among these creditors was the IRS, which claimed that Newton owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in unpaid taxes, further compounding his financial difficulties as he tried to get back on his feet. At the end of the 1990s, Wayne teamed up with fellow Las Vegas icon Tony Orlando, and the two of them started a business to open a new entertainment venue in the city. Initially called the Talk of the Town, this large venue had 2,100 seats, and both entertainers were hopeful about drawing large crowds, but their high expectations were not met once the venue doors opened. Attendance steadily declined to far below the projected numbers, with an average of fewer than 1,000 attendees. This revenue shortfall proved to be a significant challenge, especially considering that the venue's $2 million lease added to the financial strain Wayne and Tony's business already faced. 
Wayne Newton and Tony Orlando's strained partnership came to an end when Tony realized he was being spied on. The discovery that Wayne had installed recording devices in a private room that he and Tony shared was made by Tony's son, which understandably caused frustration and discord between the two partners. Following their split, Tony severed his association with Wayne and their business ties due to Wayne's installation of recording devices. Wayne then took control of the entertainment venue they had co-founded, and at the turn of the millennium, the venue's name was changed to the Wayne Newton Theater, signifying a significant change in ownership and branding, but regrettably, Wayne's interactions with the IRS worsened in the early 2000s. His tax problems kept getting worse, with the amount of unpaid taxes he owed rising steadily. These ongoing tax issues only made Wayne Newton's financial struggles during this trying time in his personal and professional life worse. Through a partnership with a company called CASD, Wayne Newton became entangled in what he saw as a potential solution to his ongoing financial difficulties in 2001. The company was willing to invest, and the plan involved turning his residence into a museum and tourist attraction, drawing inspiration from the renowned Grace and the former home of Elvis Presley. A sizable amount of roughly $70 million into this ambitious project. Of this amount, roughly $50 million was set aside for the renovation of Wayne's home into a museum honoring his life and career. The remaining $20 million went straight to Wayne, giving him the much-needed financial boost he anticipated. Wayne Newton signed a deal with CSD to turn his property into a museum and tourist attraction, but there was more to the project than just a museum. In addition to the museum, plans for a car wash and a dinner theater were included in the project, which was meant to improve the overall visitor experience. Knowing that he would eventually leave the property, but as a number of years went by, it became more and more clear that the singer had no intention of leaving, complicating the arrangement. Meanwhile, Wayne's financial problems grew, and in 2005, he found himself in legal hot water when the IRS sued him, claiming he owed them a sizable amount of money. Two years later, Wayne Newton made headlines for the wrong reason when he abandoned his private jet at Oakland International Airport. The jet needed repairs, which Wayne couldn't afford at the time, leaving him with no choice but to leave the aircraft. The amount of money in unpaid taxes added to his already significant financial burdens. After it started to deteriorate at the airport, Wayne was able to collect the money needed to have the jet disassembled and shipped to his house, where it was reassembled in his backyard in 2009. In 2009, Wayne was sued for a second time for financial reasons, this time for not paying the bill for multiple bales of hay, which highlighted the severity of his financial problems at the time. These financial setbacks and legal troubles added to the ongoing difficulties Wayne Newton faced juggling his personal and professional finances. Wayne Newton's persistently bad financial decisions have had consequences that go beyond his personal finances. Despite his seeming love for living things, Wayne has not provided the best care for the animals he keeps on his property. Wayne has taken on more responsibility than he can handle on several occasions when it comes to taking care of the variety of wild animals that his property has housed. Wayne has a genuine love for wildlife, as evidenced by his many horses as well as his exotic animal collection, which includes monkeys, sloths, exotic birds, and many other species. Unfortunately, his financial difficulties have consistently made it difficult for him to provide the animals with the care they need. The financial strain brought on by his numerous financial missteps and legal issues has unfortunately raised concerns about the welfare and well-being of these animals, highlighting the wider impact of Wayne Newton's financial difficulties on those who depend on him. In 2010, Wayne Newton became embroiled in yet another lawsuit, this time brought by a former friend who claimed that he had loaned money to Wayne Newton. The legal dispute cost the Cooner family several million dollars. Wayne was forced to sell his home as a result of the dispute, which had serious consequences for the company CSD with whom he had originally agreed to turn his house into a museum. Fortunately, CSD intervened to save the situation. They took over as the property's owners and even permitted Wayne to stay there for the time being. This brought about some brief respite. In addition, in 2010, Wayne experienced a family crisis when his pregnant daughter had serious health problems that required an early birth, and during the delivery, she went into a coma. Wayne was willing to pay whatever the doctors needed to save his daughter's life, and fortunately, she recovered from the ordeal, though it was a very difficult and expensive time for both of them. Wayne Newton's home was eventually turned into a museum by CSD, which was ultimately successful in both an emotional and financial sense. Tours were available, but the museum's operations ceased in 2018, 
the reasons for this suspension were kept a secret from the public. This marked a significant turning point for both the museum and Wayne's ongoing financial situation in 2020. When the city reopened following the period of social distancing and lockdowns, Wayne wasted no time and resumed performing on stage. This was quite a testament to his dedication to his craft, even in the face of adversity. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Wayne appeared on television in a commercial for Caesars Palace. It's important to note that, despite his financial difficulties, Wayne Newton has had the support of his family throughout his career. He was married twice the first time, in 1994, to Elaine Okamura, with whom he shared a home from 1968 to 1985. In 2021, Wayne suffered a back injury that cast doubt on his ability to continue performing. Are you interested in learning more about Wayne Newton's early life? He was born Carson Wayne Newton and is still married to Kathleen McCrone. Wayne has one daughter from each of his two marriages, which adds a personal dimension to his life in addition to his steadfast dedication to the stage. Was born to Evelyn Marie Smith, 1921-1985, and Patrick Newton, 1915-1990, an auto mechanic. Wayne's ancestry includes English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and German heritage. He also thought he had some Native American ancestry, believing that his father had Powhatan heritage and his mother had distant Cherokee roots. Not affiliated with or acknowledged by any particular Native American tribe, Wayne's early years were characterized by his family's involvement in the U.S. Navy. His father was a World War I, I Navy veteran, and the family lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where Wayne was raised. At the age of six, Wayne demonstrated a strong musical aptitude. Early on, he demonstrated his musical talent by learning to play the piano and steel guitar. He even appeared on a local music radio show where he sang and played the steel guitar before going to school. On the weekends, he participated in a traveling road show that was connected to the Grand Ole Pori, exhibiting his... When Wayne Newton was a young child, his family moved to a place near Newark, Ohio. It was during this time that he began honing his singing skills and started performing in local clubs, theaters, and fairs, frequently with his older brother Jerry. Musical abilities and laying the foundation for his remarkable career in the world of entertainment. Since his asthma posed a serious threat to his health in 1952, his doctor advised that his family relocate again, this time to Phoenix, Arizona. Shortly after moving to Phoenix, the Newton brothers competed in a local talent show called the L. King Rangers and won. This victory caught Wayne, and his brother was given their own television program, Rascals in Rhythm, under the direction of Sean, which was a huge turning point in their careers. Tom Shanty, the owner of Cool TV, noticed them and was involved in both the talent show's broadcast as well as mentoring the Newton brothers. Wayne Newton's high school years were filled with noteworthy accomplishments, including the chance to perform with a prestigious Dole Orion Roadshows, an appearance on a BC TV's Ozark Jubilee the honor of performing in front of then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower, and an unsuccessful audition for Ted Mack's original Amateur Hour. Wayne Newton attended North High School, where he was not only a standout student academically, but also the sophomore class president, demonstrating his leadership abilities. Wayne Newton also joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps, RC and Officer Training Program created to prepare people for future commission roles in the United States during his high school years. In the spring of 1958, nearing the end of his junior year in high school, Wayne's life took a dramatic turn when a Las Vegas booking agent noticed him and his brother performing on their local TV show. Impressed by their talent and potential, the booking agent booked them. Wayne's involvement in rock reflected his commitment to leadership and discipline. Signed 15-year-old Wayne Newton and his brother to a two-week contract to perform at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. Their first performance there was so successful that, on the last night of their two-week contract, they were given the opportunity to extend their stay in the city for an additional year. This was a significant moment. Wayne Newton's decision to leave North High School just before his junior year ended set the stage for his incredible journey in the entertainment industry. When Wayne Newton turned 18, he had plans to enlist in the U.S. military, but something went wrong. This decision changed Wayne Newton's life and allowed him to pursue his blossoming music career. Because of his asthma, he was granted a wuni action status, meaning that he could only serve in a major emergency. This meant that his health didn't meet the requirements for regular military service. Despite this restriction, 
Wayne Newton decided to support the military effort in a different way by volunteering his time and talent to perform shows for troops stationed overseas. Due to his asthma, Wayne Newton was unable to serve in the traditional military capacity, but he still showed his commitment to improving the health and morale of the armed forces by volunteering his time and talent to perform shows for troops stationed overseas. Wayne Newton and his brother went on an incredible journey in the entertainment industry. Wayne Newton's early success in Las Vegas was attributed to his unique ability to tailor his performances to the preferences of the audience, making his shows truly engaging and entertaining. In 1962, Newton had a pivotal moment when he performed the Irish folk song at the Flamingo in Las Vegas for an impressive five-year stretch, doing six shows a week for six days. Wayne Newton and his brother made their first appearance on The Jackie Gleason Show on September 29, 1962. Over the following two years, Wayne Newton graced Gleason's show. Danny Boy, the well-known Jackie Gleason in Phoenix, was so impressed by Newton's rendition that he requested Wayne appear on his show before any other television appearance. In the early to mid-1960s, in addition to his singing career, Wayne Newton took on a unique role in the classic Western TV series Bonanza. He acted and sang as Andy, a baby-faced Ponderosa ranch hand, and it was during the Bonanza filming that Newton first met Elvis Presley. The show ran 12 times, marking his first foray into international television, whom he would later become close friends with. In 1962, Jackie Glenn set up a performance for Wayne Newton at the Copacabana. There, he met Bobby Darin, who was impressed by Wayne's talent and agreed to produce his records. By 1963, Wayne Newton had signed a record deal with Capitol Records, releasing his debut album, which included the hit song Dana Shen. The song was originally meant for Darren to perform, but Darren thought it would be a hit for Newton and gave it to him. Dana Shen went on to reach number 13 on the Hot 100 charts. Influential figures in entertainment like Lucille Ball, Danny Thomas, George Burns, and others helped further boost Wayne Newton's career. Jack Benny hired Wayne Newton as an opening act for his booking at Haras Rano after seeing Newton perform at a nightclub in Sydney, Australia. Later, Benny invited Wayne to open for his comedy show in Las Vegas, but Newton insisted on being the main attraction, which he received in 1963. In 1965, Newton performed. CBS offered Wayne a television show based on his character on The Lucy Show, where he sang to animals. Wayne turned down the offer following Lucille Ball's advice to steer clear of being stereotypically cast as the country boy character for the remainder of his career. Wayne Newton's high-pitched voice was one of his most recognizable traits. It remained so for the majority of his career, even though it did experience some lowering in tone in the 1970 and 1980 C. In the 1970 S, Newton made the shift to concentrating mostly on performing in Las Vegas, where he continued to be a major star. Wayne Newton's career reached its pinnacle in Las Vegas in the 1970s, especially after Elvis Presley passed away and his members of the Rat Pack, like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin, grew older. This elevated Wayne Newton to the forefront as the city's top entertainer, solidifying his position as the best in show business. Due to his legendary status as a performer during the 1970s, Wayne Newton was a regular at well-known Las Vegas venues like the Desert Inn, the Frontier, and Sands Hotel and Casino. His live performances attracted incredible crowds, setting a record for the highest attendance figures of this peak era. Esquire magazine called Wayne Newton the biggest moneymaker in the history of Las Vegas, outperforming even legends like Elvis and Sinatra. His shows were notable for being particularly long, often up to three hours, which set them apart from the shorter performances of many other headliners at the time. In 1972, Wayne Newton's recording of Daddy, Don't You Walk, helped him achieve even more success. Newton's fame extended beyond Las Vegas, as he was featured in The Glenn Campbell Show, while the album of the same name peaked at number 25 on the album charts. So Fast, which sold over a million copies and earned a gold disc from the ERAA, peaked at number 4 in the US and at number 1 in Australia and Canada. In 1983, Wayne Newton was invited to perform at the Independence Day celebration on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. following a contentious ban on rock bands by James G. Watt, the Secretary of the Interior at the time. The two artists sang three songs together live in a London TV special for the BBC in 1975, showcasing his versatility as a performer. Wayne Newton took the stage to mark the occasion, 
despite the audience's mixed reactions. His career continued to thrive in the 1990s as he started headlining at casinos outside of Las Vegas, such as Bal Caesar's Palace and MGM Grand Las Vegas. In 1994, he achieved a notable milestone by doing his 25,000th solo show. In 1999, Wayne Newton inked a groundbreaking 10-year contract with the Stardust in Las Vegas, where he performed six shows a week for 40 weeks of the year in a showroom named after him. However, this deal was later terminated in 2005 due to the Stardust Casino's impending demolition. Throughout his career, Wayne Newton showed unwavering dedication to his career. Entering the 2000s, Wayne Newton continued to be a major figure in the Las Vegas entertainment scene. He not only performed live shows, but also took on a more significant role. He was a beloved and iconic figure in the entertainment industry, especially in Las Vegas, where he set multiple records and left an enduring impression. Role as a representative and ambassador for the city of Las Vegas, Wayne Newton entered the world of reality television in January 2005 with the premiere of The Entertainer on E! The winner of this show was guaranteed a spot in Wayne Newton's act in addition to a headline act of their own for a year. An opportunity for aspiring performers to work with and learn from the legendary performer Newton's connection to Las Vegas was made clear when he sang Viva Las Vegas in honor of Elvis Presley during the player introductions at the 2007 NBA All-Star Weekend in Las Vegas. Newton's journey into reality television continued when he participated in the fall 2007 season of Dancing with the Stars. He was partnered with two-time champion Cheryl Burke, but in an unusual turn of events, he was the third competitor to be eliminated. He also made history by being the first guest on Price is Right. Wayne Newton of The Price is Right began bringing guests into the show to present prizes in 2009. On October 14th, he began his show at the Tropicana in Las Vegas. In 2010, he took a hiatus to spend time with his family and train his voice for upcoming performances. In 2016, Newton returned to the stage at Bales Hotel in Las Vegas with a lounge show called Up Close and Personal. In this show, he performed live while displaying his mastery of 13 self-taught instruments, a technique he had learned to rest his voice while doing multiple shows a night at the Fremont Hotel, and he also showed movie and TV clips of Wayne Newton celebrating his incredible 60th year on stage with a show titled Mr. Las Vegas at Caesars Palace. This special performance ran from January to May, marking his enduring legacy in the city. Newton expressed his deep connection to Caesars Palace by stating this, he began his career on screen in 2019. After performing over 30,000 shows on the Las Vegas Strip in June 2020, Wayne Newton served as the spokesperson for Caesars Entertainment and television commercials across North America. The campaign's goal was to promote the reopening of Caesar Entertainment Resorts during the COVID-19 pandemic. More recently, Newton made an appearance during the 2022 NFL Draft, which was held in Las Vegas. The hotel, in my opinion, has always represented the flagship of the Strip. What do you think of Wayne Newton's announcement that Dylan Parm from Memphis University was the Las Vegas Raiders' third-round draft pick? Wayne Newton joined the Hall of Fame, running back Marcus Allen, to make the announcement. This continued his involvement in high-profile events and cemented his reputation as a respected figure not only in Las Vegas but also nationally. Having financial issues in life at the age of 80? Please share your thoughts with us in the section below. We hope you have found this video helpful. If so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next films. Subscribe Relax Brew for more videos.